Uh, so close. So let's write this out. So in terms of this one here, the key things to look at for this question when you've, you're hiring somebody is in this particular setup, it doesn't say what they're being hired for. It just says you've got six people being hired and they've got 50 applicants. So when you're looking at this guy here, you've got two things to worry about. You look at can you repeat applicants? So what do you think? Could we actually repeat applicants here? The official term is repetition. Oh, no. I missed a syllable. So what do you think? Repeat applicants? And so when we say repetition or repeat applicants, that's literally meaning you hire the same person for more than one job. Now, is that possible to do? Definitely. Is it done? I'm sure it is to save cost. But in the scope of this question, what would be the underlying assumption? Underlying assumption would be probably what? What do you guys think? It actually turns out the underlying assumption when you see these type of problems is no. So here, the underlying assumption is that if you hire six teachers or six whatevers, you won't repeat people when you hire them, unless you're told that you're going to do that. Okay. And the second thing that you look at is, does order matter? In terms of the context of how this particular question was phrased, does it matter that you hire person one first, person two second, person three third, et cetera, or is it just that we've got all six people? What do you guys think? Would order matter, the order in which do you hire the people, or does order not matter? Correct, so here order wouldn't matter, and in fact, one of the things is they could actually go through and just as a group say, hey, you got you group of six people, you've all got the job right here. Okay. And hopefully not a bulk email, but I guess they could. Okay. So what that means is if repetition is not allowed and order doesn't matter, then what you've got here is exactly 50 choose six. Now remember what 50 choose six is. 50 choose 6 is 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 times, make sure we get um, six of them, we've got five so far, far, so one more, times 45, which is exactly right, so almost. So this one here, that, that first 50 says in the first position, any of the 50 candidates could work. That 49 says in the second position, any of the remaining candidates could be just fine, and you keep going down. Now, if you only have the 50 times the 49 times the 48 times the 47 all the way to 45, that says order matters. So this part right here up top tells you order matters. So to get rid of the order matters, you divide by the five factorial. So that's the, the five factorial is the number of ways, not five factorial, six factorial, because there's six people. Pretend that's a six. Number of ways to hire the six people once you've already established which six people you're choosing. Okay? Now, the divide by six factorial gets rid of the order. So that means at this point in time, once we figure out what this integer is, what that number is, that'll be saying you're not allowed to hire the same person for more than one job, and it doesn't matter in what order you actually hire those people. So for this one here, um, it turns out to be, and I'll just go ahead and give you guys the integers, it turns out to be 1589700. So many would be the answer there. And I think that may actually have overlapped what's going to fly in next. Nope, I think I put on the next page. I think we're okay. Okay. And that's it. It's literally it. So buzzwords. In this particular case, I actually did not um, 
grab any buzzwords, but here are the common buzzwords to know you need an N choose K. Do you see the buzzword choose? It's probably like 75% of the time you're going to use one of these N choose K situations. You still want to go ahead and check, hey, am I allowed to repeat things? Um, does it matter what order I select my things? Uh, some You see select, but it's not as frequent. Choose is really the big one that you typically see. Okay. Oh, the other big one in this one is much, much rarer combination. Or combinations so, but the big buzzword really is this word choose although it's not a hundred percent you can definitely have that happening in other situations too all right so that was a part a part B is where we're going to actually put some specificity on it okay so any questions before we move on to the next part all right I'm not seeing any questions yet so let us move to the next part of this question so still the same You've got some high school, they're trying to hire six teachers, they've got 50 applicants. So that part's gonna stay the same. Here's how it changes. Okay. So, so of those six positions that they're trying to hire, suppose that two of the six are actually, they're trying to hire English teachers. Three of the six, they're actually trying to hire biology teachers. And the last one of the six is they're trying to hire an art teacher. Now, of the 50 applicants that got in, let's suppose that all of the people applying actually did have some credentials in English, biology, or art. So of those 50 applicants, let's say 15 of them have some sort of background in art, 25 of them have some sort of background in biology, and the remaining 10 have some sort of background in English. So assuming that our school hires the teachers with the appropriate backgrounds for their position, in other words, somebody with a background in English gets hired as an English teacher, how many ways are there to hire these six new teachers? Now, this one is a little bit different than the last one because you're supposed to match criteria. In other words, English background to English teacher. So if we look at this and we do a little bit of the sort of scratch work like we've done previously, maybe we have this little block here for English teacher. Maybe we have this little block here for biology. Any guesses what we should put in that first little block? And now, 10. Close, not quite, but close. So the thing to look for is, let's focus on English first. We have two openings for English and we have a grand total of, where'd it go? Of the applicants, how many are English? 10 applicants have a background in English. So the 10 is definitely involved. If we only put the 10 here, then what will it mean? It means we're really only filling one position for English, and that's fine, but we have a second position. So if we do two positions at once, we would have 10 times, and how would we get that second person? Yeah. Now, here's the big question. Does order matter? Does it matter that we um, hired English teacher number one before English teacher number two? Assuming we hire them all from that same pool of applicants, the answer would, of course, be no. And this would be where you would then divide by 2 factorial, and 2 factorial is just 2, saying it doesn't matter if we hired teacher 1 first or teacher 2 first. So there's only two options there. Now, that is exactly the same as, and I'm going to go ahead and put the actual formula down here. This is exactly the same as 10 choose 2. And I'll label this with an E for English because I'm lazy. Now, any guesses what the what would happen with biology? Now, remember what's going on with biology. We've got three positions for biology, and we have 25 applicants. Yeah. So this one here would be you have a grand total of 
25 applicants, so 25 potential teachers, you're going to choose three of them. Or if we write it out, and really these two guys probably should be reversed, because down here's the formula and up here's the actual work. With the biology one, that's exactly the same as saying, hey, I've got 25 potential candidates for the first biology teacher position, 24 for the second biology teacher position, and 23 for the third and last biology teacher position, and we'll divide by three factorial. Why the three factorial? Because that gets rid of the order. And if you've got three positions, there's three factorial ways of telling which of those people they're hired for second or third. Now, last one is art. So for art, we have only one position open for an art teacher. And we've got how many? We've got 15 applicants. How would we select our art teacher? Yep, so if we did it in terms of the n choose k, we would have, how many of them, 15 choose 1. Anybody got what 15 choose 1 actually equals, though? It's actually just 15. So this one, if you, you do, if I'd actually put art first, if you just put an integer out there at the beginning, you would have, well, let's, it would have been the same thing either way when you only choose the one. Okay. So formulas at the bottom. So I'll put an arrow in terms of how we're going. Here's the formula. Here we go up to our second position. And then this guy, if we actually multiplied it all out, did I multiply this guy all out? That first one here, just to walk us through it, this guy right here, 9 times 10. Well, 2 factorial is the same as 2, so 10 and 2 will cancel to be 5. 5 times 9 is 45. The middle number is large. The middle number right here, you've got 3 factorial, which is the same as 6. 6 would cancel with 24. 24 getting canceled with 6 would leave a factor of 4. 4 times 25 is 100. So 100 times 23 is 2300. And we already have the 15 at the end. So multiply this all together, and that's 1552500. No lies. I did that one before class, so I didn't have to do it all in my head real quick. So this would then be the answer, and this, those would be your formulas. Okay. So if you were ever asked, make sure you write or told, please write the formulas for your work. That first one right there with the 10 choose 2, 5 choose 3, 15 choose 1 would be the formulas. The quite honestly, that second step that's really above the one that has the arrow that says formulas, that has all the formulas written out just without the symbols dealing with n choose k. Okay? Makes sense? Kind of feeling okay at least a little bit so far. Notice the strategy that I showed you here, it was sort of a combination of what we did previously using the new things. It depends on which of these two ways of building the formula you use. So this one down here looks identical to what we did before, except for grouping a bunch of things together. So before we had placeholders to do whatever it is we were doing. Here we're now inside of our placeholders. Still, on this one just dealt with one person, but over here we dealt with two or three people all together. Or up here, if we actually did a different placeholder for each of the six positions, we would have had to divide by the two factorial or divide by the three factorial across several of the positions. So it's an, sort of an adjusted format of what we did previously. Okay. But let's do one more example, and then I'm going to throw you guys into working on some questions on your own. And the next example is a super-duper classic example, and it deals with coins. So one of the classic examples when you're dealing with various counting things is, well, it was originally back in, what, 17, 1800s when this stuff was really first getting its foot in the door. And a lot of it actually pulled, well, I don't really want to say a lot of it, but a, a number of it was actually rooted with people playing games or gambling. So you'll see things with cards and dice and coins, and those are the sort of very, very, very classic sort of first examples that you see can be used as any sort of examples where you're dealing with counting something, but those are sort of the classic first draft examples. 
Now, this one here, being a classic example, deals with a coin, and we're going to toss our coin four times. Now, we looked at this example previously, and we said previously that, hey, how many total outcomes could we have if we tossed a fair coin that only was going to land on its head or its tail each time? How many different outcomes were possible? Anybody remember? So total possibilities. I think this was Thursday we had that example. Well, if you toss the coin once, there'd be two possibilities. If you cost the coin four times, though, any guess is how many possibilities. The two definitely is in play. Yep, it would be. So total possibilities would be actually two to the fourth, or two times two times two, two possibilities for each of those positions. Now, what that means is each of these following questions, and I believe I've got three questions related to this situation, the answer for each one of those has to be what? If we got an answer bigger than 16, could we ever be right, in other words? Correct. Definitely don't have an answer bigger than 16, and since we're counting things, the smallest we could ever have is zero, and the only time you're going to get an answer of zero is if it's a situation that could never exist. So if you look at your question and you know that it could exist at least once, your answer is going to be somewhere between 1 and 16. So worst case scenario, you don't have a lot of possibilities to choose from. Okay? But let's be strategic about this and make sure we get a right answer. So this one here says, how many ways are there to get exactly three heads. Now, you could, of course, write them out. This is a small enough example that you could totally write it out. So, for example, maybe you have head, head, forgot the bar, tail. So, notice with three heads, that means you also have one tail. So, anybody got a guess for what another outcome would be that would give you exactly three heads? Yep, the tail could come first and then all the heads come second. Anybody have another guess for a possible outcome with three heads and one tail? Yep, you could have the tail come second. Anybody got another guess? Yep, and here the tail could come third. Now here is the question for us. Are those all of the possibilities with three heads and one tail? What do you think? Is there any other way that we could toss this coin and get three heads and one tail that's different from what we wrote down? Full disclosure, it's definitely easier to pay attention to the tail. So here, three heads, one tail. If you try to find all the different places that the heads could be rearranged on, you might get overwhelmed. But notice with only one tail, where can the tail live? The tail could live in the very first position. The tail could live in the second position. The tail could live in the third position or come up on the third toss. Or the tail could live in the fourth position or come up in the fourth toss. Is there any other place for that one tail to come up? Well, there's only four tosses, so the one tail has to come up either on toss one, two, three, or four, and we've taken care of all of those situations. So this would be the only four possibilities when you have exactly one tail or exactly three heads. And that's something to pay attention to if you have a binary choice, if you have a choice between two objects. And sometimes it's easier to look at the guy that you weren't actually originally talking about because maybe it's easier to look at that guy. Now, it turns out that this is actually a special case. And I'm going to claim that to get that answer of how do you find exactly three heads, you do it the following way. Four, choose three. Now, if you actually calculate four, choose three, notice what happens. Four, choose three is four times three times two divided by a three factorial. Now, three factorial, remember, is three times two times one. So the threes cancel, the twos cancel, and we will simply get four, which is the answer we were supposed to get. Now, let's think about why 
four choose three is the appropriate thing here, and it, it wasn't just coincidence that we got an answer of four there. So anybody have a guess what that four choose three is representing in this particular question? So there's a four and a three. Any guesses what the four might represent? It's the number of blank. Um, if you actually write it as four choose three, it would not be referring to the tail. If you wanted to specifically talk about the tail, I mean, it's gonna give you the same answer whether you deal with heads or tails. But if you want to specifically talk about the tail, you would write four choose one. Okay. So the four here, up to the number on top, that is your number of tosses. And, oh, I thought that was gonna take longer to write. And the three represents, any guesses what the three represents? Especially now that I gave you that four, choose one at the end. So if you look back at the pattern, or you look back at the question, yeah, so it'd be referring to the three heads. Now it's specific where those three heads are. So this is your three heads, and specifically we're looking at the positions, or which toss, we're selecting which toss we wanna put the heads at. So this four choose three says, of these four positions, toss one through four, we're gonna pick three of them, we're gonna select three of them. And it doesn't matter the order in which we select them, it's just which three we select, which is where we're gonna put the three heads. Now this sort of formula right here, with the only one and choose K formula, works when you have a binary choice, when you have only two things happening. Why? Because once you select these three positions for your heads, okay, so, example, one, two, three, four positions for your toss. Once you select where your heads are gonna be, what happens? Since there's only two possibilities, heads or tails, everywhere where you haven't selected where the heads are gonna go, that's gonna automatically be a tail, okay? Now, if you don't have two choices, if, say you have three choices, like what we had previously, this here would be the same sort of idea that you would do with three choices. First, maybe you'd select where the heads go. Then when you, you're in your remaining choices, maybe you then select where your what, tails go and then your last choice, which is I don't even know what, would you'd figure out where they would go, okay? But when there's only two choices, you only need the one combination here, potentially, um, as long as it's an either or, if each position is an either or. So if you've got a, if you're doing all positions and it's a two in each of those slots, that's when this works. But anyway, the thing that this is doing is it's literally selecting the location where your heads are gonna be placed and then all the remaining guys over your tails are. Conversely, you can also do it here where you go ahead and you say, hey, I've got four positions, I'm gonna select the one position for the tail so this one here deals with tail, one tail. And then all the remaining positions that aren't where the tail are, they're all gonna be heads, okay? So in this one, you can either focus in on the head or the tail. Okay. Now, suppose you have a very, very similar question. There's really only one big change, I guess two big changes. Here, we're gonna be asked how many ways are there to get at least two heads? So the number changes from exactly three to two. And it also changes from the word exactly to at least. Both of those two things change up how the problem works. So it turns out in this particular situation, um, what happens? Well, we could actually have exactly two heads. So here we could have two heads. And if you have two heads, you'd also have two tails. But you could also have the situation where you have how many heads? Yeah, you could have three heads just like what we had previously. 
And if you have three heads, you have one tail. And you could also have the situation where you have what? What's our last situation we could have? Yeah, you could have four heads and then zero tails. Okay? Now, good news is two out of these three are really easy to calculate. So, for example, this one right here where we have exactly three heads and one tail, we literally just calculated it. I'm going to go ahead and put in the formula, but we already know that this formula is what? This formula is 4. So I'll put an equals over here, and I'll put a 4 to indicate that middle position. Now, the other easy one is this guy at the end, which says you're selecting what? You're selecting all positions to be heads. How many possibilities are there where all four of those tosses turned out to be heads? Any guesses? So in terms of a number, it would be 1. But in terms of the choose, it would be 4, choose 4. Or if you want to do it off the tail, you could say 4, choose 0. Okay. Now, any guesses why would add those two guys together? We're actually going to add all of them together. Anybody have a guess on why we would add them together? as opposed to multiply, like what we've been doing in the past, or at least the past for today. The answer is really straightforward. However, it's not always easy to spot, which is why I wanted to make sure to do a question like this. And I am getting no guesses. So it turns out, here's how you know. You're going to add things together if they're different cases. In other words, a possibility inside of these two different cases or any old outcome can't be in more than one case. So here, is there any way that you could have somebody that has three heads and one tail also be included in the count of all four heads? Can you have any outcome that you toss with your coin be in both of these two situations, be described by both of those two descriptions, three heads, one tail, as well as all four heads. And hopefully all of you are thinking, no, that's impossible, we can't do both. So these are where you literally break up your possibilities into different scenarios. If you have different scenarios with no overlap whatsoever, this is when you would add things together. Compare and contrast. Whoops, don't do that. In the last example that we had, what we were doing, we were hiring these teachers. In this particular case, all of the teachers were being hired at the exact same time. So since all of this stuff was going on at the exact same time, it was part of building your larger formula, these guys got multiplied together. Whereas in this second situation over here, you're actually still trying to get to that one count, but there isn't, there's no way to put them into one situation. This is where you have like a case one, a case two, a case three, because it's different formulas involved to finding out what's going on with these different situations. Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. So let's get the missing piece. Anybody have a guess on what to do with this missing first piece right here? So this one here would be a four, choose two. So you have four tosses and you select two of those tosses where you insert heads, or if you wanted to think about it in terms of tail, four tosses and two of them where you would insert your tail. Now the only thing we then have to figure out is what is that equal? And it turns out it's gonna equal six. Here's how. We've got four times three divided by two factorial. Two factorial is exactly the same thing as two. So it's almost like you're not even putting the factorial. So notice what happens. The 4 and the 2 will cancel. You get a 2 on top. So this whole thing right here equals 6. So add it all together. And 11 out of our 16 possibilities should have at least two heads. Notice you could also have done this the reverse way. You could have said, all right, well, how many ways are there to get 
less than two heads, so exactly one head or no heads, add up those many cases, and then you go ahead and subtract it from 16. Uh, that's just, so this here, that is just the formula for this guy. So in terms of your formula, you always start with whatever the top number is, in our case, the four, and then it's like a factorial. You multiply by every integer less than, so the next integer smaller than four is three, and then you keep going until you get the same number of factors as the number on the bottom. So we have two on the bottom, so we stopped at the second factor. That's the fastest way to compute these um, and choose K guys, by far the fastest way of doing it. But it's basically like a factorial, eh, the, uh, the other formula is a factorial on top, but it's basically a factorial on top, but you truncate your factor factorial once you get the same number of factors or numbers, integers, as that number on the bottom. All right, so last part of this question, which unfortunately is just slightly over lapping the written words. This one asks, how many ways are there to get at least two heads, so you need two or more heads, and at least one tail? So for this one, any guesses what our possibilities would be? What situations could we actually see in our outcomes? Well, you could have two heads. If you have exactly two heads, you would also have two tails. Let me do it sideways here, maybe this will help. But what's another situation? We could also have how many heads? Could we have more than two heads? Yep, we could have three heads and one tail. Could we have any more than three heads in this scenario? Correct, and you can't have any more than three heads because what happens if you had four heads, and let me actually just go ahead and write it down. If you had four heads, you'd have what? You'd have zero tails, and that doesn't meet the last criteria that says you have to have at least one tail. So let's go ahead and figure out what um, these guys actually equal. Well, we've actually already calculated both of them before. The two heads and two tails, we said previously was four choose two, and we said that was the four times three divided by two factorial, or six. And our four choose three, this is the one we actually calculated in part A. This is exactly the same that we said was four times three times two divided by three factorial, or four. Which means, what's the actual answer? Yep, just add them together. So this would be four choose two plus four choose three, all equals 10 or just six plus four. I on purpose broke this out. That way that was really a question of, should I multiply or should I add them together? And when you have separate cases where there's, it's not the same thing, they're legitimately two different things that you're dealing with, that's when you would add them together, okay? So that takes care of the first several examples that I wanted to go over today. For the next little bit, let's say about, oh, 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna throw you guys into working on some of these questions by yourself. So specifically, you need to have a copy of the questions from activity seven, or at least somebody from your group has a copy. They are currently up on Canvas, so if you didn't get a copy of that before class, they're up there right under, um, what, what's today's date, the 8th? They're right under there, under June 8th. I'll go ahead and share that with you real quick. Okay. So, if we look under this one here, counting topic that we're ending up on today, you can look right here under activity 8, not 8, 7, 7. We're not, based on the time, we're not gonna get to activity 8 today. All right, so I am going to go ahead and throw you guys into groups. They are currently already automatically assigned by uh, WebEx. But before we jump into doing that, were there any questions from you guys? 
And these questions for you guys to look at are very similar to the ones that we just went over. All right, I am seeing no questions from you guys. If you do end up with questions while you're inside of these little breakout sessions, um, remember to push that button that says ask for help near the top of the screen and I will get a notice and I'll come directly to you guys. Order matters. So if order matters, the idea here is if you're writing out your objects, it actually matters if the first one comes first or if the first one comes second. If you can repeat your objects however you want to, this is where you're gonna build things that have exponents in them. This is where you can, I did reuse the objects, but the official buzzword is repetition allowed, so repeating things in your list. Um, if you're not allowed to repeat things in your list, this is where the factorials come out or the falling factorials. Remember, falling factorials was simply you didn't write the full factorial, you stopped at a certain point in time. And this is like, if you have people, you can't reuse the same person more than once if they're in a line. So both of these are very much, you're building something in a line. Over here with order doesn't matter, you're very much building a set. And notice we talked about back when we were dealing with sets, the order of which the objects are listed in the set doesn't matter as long as they're the same objects, okay? We haven't gotten to this one yet, but I went ahead and put in the formula right here. Notice it looks exactly like an n choose k, but there's two parentheses. We're actually gonna talk about that one next, okay? This is where it's okay to repeat objects or reuse objects, but the order still doesn't matter. So it's like building a set where you have repeated objects in the set and that's okay. okay. Repetition not allowed, so you're not allowed to use the same object more than once. This one, is the n choose k. This is the one where the actual objects aren't allowed to be reused. And to remind ourselves, since we've talked about it today, the top of this n choose k, when you start calculating it, would be n times n minus one. Keep going until you get to the kth factor. So this is the same as n minus k minus one, all divided by k factorial. Or, if you prefer to just put everything in terms of factorials, this is n factorial over k factorial, and then n minus k factorial. That is so trying to be a factorial there on the side that I ran out of space on, okay? So this is a snapshot of everything that we've done previously, today, and in just a second. So let me go ahead and do a couple of properties and then we'll jump into that last counting technique. So the first thing is, well, what happens if you're dealing with n choose k? It turns out this guy is always some positive integer except in one case, and this is the case where your, well, your k is bigger than n. In other words, you're trying to select more objects than what you actually have. Now, second thing is n choose zero. So this says you have n objects and you select exactly none of them. This one is always one, okay? Why? There's one way to build the empty set, if you will. Turns out this is also exactly the same as n choose n. So you have a grand total of n objects. What happens? You try to select all of them well, there's only one way to do that. You just grab them all. We also have n choose one. So this is you have a total of n objects and you select exactly one of them. We looked at this one today. This one turns out to always be n. This is also, and we looked at this when we were dealing with the coins of heads and tails. This turns out to be exactly the same thing as n select everybody except for one of them. Why? Because it's, it's similar to that head tail problem where you can either select it or you can not select it. Now this next one that is n choose two, this guy turns out to be, and this one, let me do the formula first. So this is n times n minus one, all divided by two factorial or two. It turns out that this guy is exactly the same as one plus two plus three plus dot, 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 plus n minus one. Weird, but true. It also turns out it's the same as 
picking all of your objects except for two of them. So that's the weird one that I wanted to show you. So looking at these guys right here, it turns out that this property is generalizable. It turns out any time that you calculate one of these n choose k's, you can also do its symmetric guy, which is n choose k, n choose n minus k. This is can be helpful. So for example, where this guy is helpful, suppose you want to calculate 10 choose 7, which technically speaking is 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6. Oh, I am regretting choosing this one already, times 4 all divided by 7 factorial, which you can totally do. But it also is 10 choose who? What's the other number that could be below that 10? Using the property we just looked at. So it's currently 10 choose 7. Who could it also be according to this property right here? Right, so it's also 10 choose 3. How do we get the 3? That 3 was 10 minus 7 or 3. Now, if you try to calculate 10 choose 3, you'll get 10 times 9 times 7. Notice we went out three places. Divide by 3 factorial. Notice if you're trying to compute these two fractions, they're both going to give you the exact same number. The only difference here is the 10 choose 3 is going to give you that same number a whole lot faster. Why? Because there's a lot less numbers involved. Okay, So that's actually where this property right here is used a lot. If you have a n choose k and the k is really large, it's bigger than the halfway mark, you flip it and get the one that's easier to compute. Okay, If you never want to use it, you don't have to. It's a shortcut. Now, the last property that we want to look at is this property right here that says if you add two combinations together, n choose k and n choose k plus 1, so they're consecutive in terms of that lower number, the claim is you can actually combine them into a single combination. It turns out that this is the basis for somebody called Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle is typically used in high school to multiply out polynomials. There's a huge tie-in with combinations in polynomials with their coefficients, um, but you may or may not have used it, or you may or may not have been told what the name was. So it's this guy. You always start with a one. The next row down is two ones. They're always offset. The next row down is ones on the outside and a two in the middle. The next row down is down is one three three one and then we start getting into the proper pattern that's not just ones on the outsides and a number in so the next number down is you always have ones on the outside of the row one number in for the row is the actual number of the row so this top one is considered the zeroth row the second row down is considered the first row next row down is considered the second row Next row down is considered the third row. And the one we're currently building is considered the fourth row. Okay. Now, anybody guess or remember how to get that middle number? In other words, anybody have a guess on what that middle number is that's missing off this fourth row? Specifically, what should I write there? Hmm? So this one turns out to be six. And let's do one more row. Anybody have a guess what the fifth row would look like? After the easy parts, I'll put ones on the outsides. So what do you guys think should be inside of those ones? You spot the pattern. Or remember it if you have talked about this guy before. Yes, so you have 5 on the inside, and then we'll have 10, 10, and notice how we got each of these numbers. The ones on the outside, they're just ones, they're stationary. But all of these inside numbers, 
You can get them from where? You can get them from adding the two numbers above. So for this 10, we added 4 and 6 to get the 10. For this 3, we added the 2 and the 1 to get the 10. This here rep illustrates this example. Now, why does this illustrate the example? Because Pascal's triangle, while often people see it in an algebra class for the first time, is actually a table of all your combinations. This very, very first one up here, that is 0, choose 0. The second line down right here, that is 1, choose 0, and 1, choose 1. Third row is 2, choose 0, which is 1. 2, choose 1, which is 2. And 2, choose 2, which is 1. Third row down is 3, choose 0, which is 1. 3, choose 1, which is 3. 3, choose 2, which is 3. And 3, choose 3, which is 1. And we'll do one last row. 4, choose 0. Fourth row down is 1. 4, choose 1 is 4. 4, choose 2, 6. 4, choose 3 is 4. And 4, choose 4 is 1. Notice here, they are the exact same numbers right there. This is actually one of the ways that people will memorize some of the small values of n choose k just because they know this Pascal's triangle or a scratch work to the side, they write it out real quick. You can keep going as long as you want. If you wanted to do like the example we had on the last slide, which was 10 choose 7, you could write it out to 10 rows. I don't know that I would recommend doing that in any way, shape, or form, but this is a way to deal with small combinations as well. Notice what it also illustrates to you right here. This tells us that 4 choose 2 is the same as 3 choose 1 plus 3 choose 2. Notice this matches up here where n equals 3 and k equals 1. But you can also see that in the actual chart right here, you add those two guys together, it drops a row, and you get that new 6. Okay. So this is also one of the properties that you can see of the n choose k guys. Questions make sense, kind of feeling a little bit okay. We're going to get back to other stuff here in just a second now. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so let us move on. All right, so what we're going to need to deal with that last thing of counting is something called a multi-set. A multi-set is exactly the same as a normal set, except you can duplicate objects and it's okay. okay? So cardinality Consider the same as with the regular set. You just count up the number of objects in your multi-set. The second new thing is multiplicity. Multiplicity of one of the elements of your multi-set is going to count the number of times that that particular object is repeated in your multi-set. So, for example, suppose you've got this guy. Now, notice there's a couple of things about him. First thing is I labeled it with MM for multi-set. But first real thing is notice the symbols. They're not those curly braces of a regular set. They're these pointed brackets. And that pointed bracket tells you that, hey, I didn't make a mistake when I duplicated this five several times. Those fives really need to stay in there. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing to notice is we actually do have duplications. Please note, so over here to the side, if we actually wrote the set one, one, two, three, notice it's much smaller. If we use curly braces, we those two ones shouldn't have been there. So really, it's the same thing as writing down the elements without duplications. And remember, we talked about this back when we were talking with sets. So here are the multi-sets. That's why you need the different symbols at the end there to indicate it's, you keep the duplications. Now, suppose we're asked some questions about this guy. And suppose for this one, maybe you're asked something like, oh, I don't know. Maybe the cardinality of M. So what do you guys think? What would be the cardinality of M here? And the second thing we'll be asked about is multiplicity, so I'll put that in for here for just a second. Nine? Yeah, that looks like nine. Now, what about multiplicity of 5? If somebody asked you what was the multiplicity of 5, what would you say? Yep, 
and just the number of times five shows up there, so the multiplicity of five is three. And notice it's totally fine to have one copy of elements. So suppose you were asked about the multiplicity of element two. What would be the multiplicity of element two? So interesting fact, it does turn out that all regular sets are also multi-sets. So all sets are also multi-sets, but the reverse is not true. Case in point, this example right here, this example M is not a regular old set because of the duplicates. You can tell if your multi-set is really a regular old set if the multiplicity of all of its elements are one. Okay. Now, Let's move on to how, why we care about our multi-sets. Okay, so remember, key thing to remember, multi-set, it looks like a set, but there's duplicated objects. Okay. We care about the multi-set because of, why did those not fly in? Oh, I guess I didn't set up the fly-ins right. So multi-choose is the number of different multi-sets that you can build. So we're literally building a set where the duplicates are allowed, so it's, we're really building a multi-set. So this is the one, it looks like an N choose K, except there's an extra set of parentheses, and the program automatically nested the parentheses with the little ones smaller. That's not actually true. They're normally written as the same size parentheses. But it turns out you rewrite them in the following way. You say N multi choose K is the same as N plus K minus one choose K. What do we do? We take all the objects we have plus the worst case scenario where you can duplicate them, so here we added the extra k minus one copies to get a total of k copies of whatever your object was. And then we're gonna choose a grand total of k of them. So for example, down here, this first one is, wow, and I didn't put the extra line around. Sorry about that, guys. N multi choose one. So as you have n objects, you're gonna select exactly one of those n objects. And you can have duplicates if you want. Well, with one object, there is no duplicate. Now, if we look at the second example, we have exactly one object, and we're going to select it k times. So this is picked one object. And this one here is we have one object, and it's selected or chosen k times. So this one. Because we only have the one object to select from, each time you pick a new object, it really is that another copy of that same object. Now, the only one that's slightly interesting is this two multi-choose two. So if we plug in the formula, this would be looking up at the formula two plus two, subtract one. So you add the tops and the bottoms and you subtract one, choose two. This is the same thing as three choose two, which is the same thing as three. Now. What does it actually mean? It means you start off and you have a regular old set that has two objects in it. So maybe A and B. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna build some multi-sets. Specifically, our multi-sets need to have two objects in them. So if we then build a multi-set, with two objects, what are our possibilities? Well, we could pick A and B, but we could also pick, anybody have a guess what another possibility would be? According to the formula, there's supposed to be three of them. So that means there's theoretically two more options for our multi-set that has cardinality two. Where the only objects in the multi-set are the A and the B. So any guesses what we could do with our multi-set? Remember. You can repeat objects. Well, if we just flip-flopped the order of the elements, those two guys, wow, that didn't work. Those two guys are actually equal to each other. So that's not a new guy. So we also have where we have two A's, and we also have where we have two B's. 
And those are the three multi-sets that we could build. Now, we're totally out of time. The next and really the last example that I had planned for this one here is something that's not only rooted in the math that actually is one of the story problems like what we have with our other counting questions. So next time, we'll start up with a story problem question that deals with this guy, and then we'll talk about pigeonhole principle, and then I'll take care of all of our counting topics. The next topic we're going to jump in to after counting is going to be dealing with relations. So we'll be doing that for the rest of the week. But we'll finish up the last couple of examples with counting next time. Um, I'll hang out for a couple minutes if you guys have questions, but we are done. That is it for today.